Good morning, folks in the US. Evening, afternoon, if you're you if you're in Europe or Asia or anywhere else in the world. Um, welcome to today's presentation um, and debate. And uh, we felt it was high time to have a deep look at what's going on in the world of automation after after a very volatile eighteen months of trying to figure out how to exist in a virtual environment. Um, and uh, just before we start, uh, we keep this interactive. So if you have questions uh, for the panel as we go through today's conversations, um, you can see the Q&A um, slot in the uh, Zoom in the Zoom tab. So just click on there, type in the question, submit. If you don't know how to use Zoom by now, I think there's a problem. But uh, there you go. Feel free to send a few questions in. We'll try and get to them uh, as we can. Um, and uh, to start, I'd like to actually introduce a phenomenal lineup of folks that we've uh, convinced to spend the, the next hour or so with us. Um, so I'm going to start with some introductions. Uh, Josiah uh, Trigoni, uh, would you like to say hello to everybody? Quick brief yeah, background on what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. I see all the uh, the greetings coming in from across the world. That's uh, that's really cool, Chicago land. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, again, I'm Josiah Trigoni. I am the head of intelligent automation for T-Mobile USA. Um, I am a one trick pony in the sense that uh, wireless is all I've done uh, my entire adult life. So I've been doing this for around 25 years. I have experience across both the business as well as technology sides. Uh, currently, obviously, in the technology side, uh, embracing uh, RPA and leading that for T-Mobile, as well as uh, some of the low-code uh, application creation. So, hello. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you. And uh, Naga or Nagarjan Chakravarti uh, for Myopix, how do you do? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Um, it's a pleasure to be a uh, part of this uh, discussion. A quick introduction about myself. My name is Naga. I am the Chief Digital Officer at IOPEX, uh, primarily helping um, large size enterprise to drive transformation. Uh, you know, as part of transformation, uh, there's a lot of technologies uh, come in play. I think uh, RPA is one, low code, no code is one, and, and truly uh, driving uh, cloud adoption. So the last three years have been a fun journey uh, in terms of uh, understanding what exactly the, the large company CXOs require. And I think pandemic has created an, and I would say a reset button, but I think it's in very contextual and uh, timely in terms of uh, discussing what's going to be there for the next five years uh, uh, with respect to uh, driving um, enterprise level digital transformation. Thank you for having me, and it's going to be a fun discussion. Uh, you know, interesting topics uh, that we have in back. Awesome. Uh, now on to Paul Paul Kersey, Senior Director, Products and Automation at Overstock. Uh, great to have you on here, Paul. Great, great to be here. I'm really excited about this uh, technical trajectory that we're on with uh, automation. Uh, I've been with Overstock uh, just coming up to eight years. Um, early pioneer in the online retail space and uh, really excited about the whole aspect to do with improving uh, EBITDA per employee and looking at uh, how we can really focus more resources on um, maximizing customer value rather than slaving away internal process. Um, <clears throat> my background has been working with major corporates, uh, IBM, KPMG, uh, other areas. Uh, but the retail space is is unique, um, and it's it's really boomed actually in in the uh, advent of uh, the pandemic, um, and we've had a lot of stresses and strains uh, because of the increase in volume, and so uh, very interesting and exciting area to be looking at right now, and happy to be here. Good. Well, being happy is the main thing, right? Uh, yeah. So we couldn't we couldn't. Uh spend the next hour without a couple of analysts on the on the line. Uh, Ritika Fleming, how are you doing? Very well, thank you, Phil. 
Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Ruthika Fleming, research leader with HFS. I'm also a one-trick pony as I've only ever been an analyst <laughs> throughout my career so far. Um, so I cover data and analytics, um, the, the march towards you know, AI with, with machine learning. So um, as a subset of that, I also, you know, in the last few years, have looked at how process intelligence technologies are, you know, have, have uh, very much come to the forefront in this industry. So looking forward to the discussion um, all, all around data leading on from automation. Um, I also cover our, um, you know, functional uh, topics around finance uh, and then insurance from an industry standpoint both of which have been poster children for uh, automation initiatives, right? So, uh, but my conversations today all, all revolve around data with them too. So looking forward to this one. Excellent. You have the queen of data, uh, moving over to the, the king of automation himself, Mr. Reiner, Mr. Dr. Thomas Reiner, how are you doing? Not too, too shabby. Thanks, Phil. And delighted to be here. So I head up uh, our IT service coverage and also drive some of our thought leadership and automation. And of late, I'm thinking a lot of the most we have done, I think, uh, probably sound to some sound like a broken record because we have to not just look at through the lens of RPA. There's so much more out there which we have to consider. But whatever, to have a better panel as today and just helps us to cutting through all the market noise on automation. So delighted to be here. Excellent. Thank you, Tom, and uh, I'm Phil First. I'm hosting today the CEO at HFS. Uh, I've been an analyst for most of my career, but I've also been uh, an advisor with Deloitte Consulting back in the day as well. So I, uh, I've worked out when I went back to research, it's far more fun talking about this than actually doing it. So um, uh, I look forward to uh, sharing some insights with you. Um, a little bit about us at HFS. Uh, it's interesting because everyone used to know this and no one does anymore, but we wrote the very first piece ever about RPA back in 2012, um, almost exactly nine years ago. Um, and we started off uh, talking about it as a threat to outsourcing, believe it or not, the, the BPO space in, in particular, where high throughput, high intensity processes could be uh, replaced with digital workers. Uh, we put it out on the blog. Before we knew it, it was in The Economist, Business Week, it went everywhere and uh, RPA was born and uh, we made many people rich, very rich, billionaires in fact. Um, unfortunately, didn't make us that rich, but we're still here analyzing the space and talking about it. Um, and then we even had the temerity back in 2019, exactly two and a half years ago, to announce this sort of standalone hype RPA was actually dead and we're moving into a period of much more integrated automation platforms. So that'll dominate much of our conversation today um, but when we look over the last three four decades of our industry um, you know we can go back to shared services and, and the uh, advent of analog outsourcing we saw the the first real impacts of cloud and digital around 10 years ago um, then we came to this environment we call a lot uh, about one office now which is more getting more front to back processes designed etc um, and uh as we look out into the future, we're in a world where we're looking much more at autonomous supply chains, much more data-driven organizations, this final phase of widespread cloudification. Um, and that was 2025 until the pandemic and everything's been brought forward a lot into a much more fluid, unstructured ecosystem. But the one thing I'll take away from this is until the last year and a half, we were pretty much doing things the same way, just a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper, we move data around the company more efficiently, uh, but we weren't making fundamental, uh, painful changes to uh, the business that we needed to make. And many businesses didn't actually have to make any changes until they had to start operating in these virtual environments. Um, actually looking at simple steps and processes, realizing we need to do things differently. Uh, and the painful change is happening now. I mean, everyone is going through it. Uh, lots of virtual transitions with clients that we talk to, uh, some are moving fast, some are struggling and moving a bit slower, and some want to snap back to the way things were. Um, and it's interesting, uh, we, we just pulled off a study of the Fortune 1000, and I thought I'd use this to base a lot of our conversation today, because we were talking uh, to a split of business and IT leaders on how they were viewing, managing, intending uh, to develop automation into their strategies. And you can see here, uh, over the last 18 months, 
the prioritization of automation has really increased um, for nearly 90% of, of, of large enterprises. Um, so most of us are at the point uh, where we're trying to get data to win in our markets. Um, and whether it's supply chain, macro, uh, environment data, or internal operational efficiency, we're trying to get data. That's the, that's the job that we all have. We've had countless roundtables with enterprises um, in the last year and a half in particular, where they're all, they're all data governance people now. Everyone is trying to figure out how to get the data they want. But to get to that data, you have to rethink your processes to get it. You've then got to design um, these new processes in the cloud. Otherwise, uh, you can't have lots of on-premise. You can't have siloed functions, not uh, flowing data with each other. So you've got a design process in the cloud. And then when it's in the cloud, you've got to automate it. Um, and you've got to do it in the cloud. And, and that's not a strategy. It's a discipline. We call it a native discipline, uh, where it's something you need to uh, uh, really apply to everything that you do. It's got to be automated. It's got to free flow. You've got to have front to back processes that work efficiently, uh, that operate uh, and create a backbone. So you can start to look at AI and computer vision, machine learning, uh, self-remediation. The more AI you can apply to your data, the more you refine it and the smarter you get. And then you keep going around this cycle. Now, if you're in a consumer products or retail business, for example, today, you have AI, you cannot survive without AI and linkages to walmart.com, Amazon, hey, Overstock, any of these companies, right? Uh, you, need, you need to be predictive, you need to be smart, you need to have, have a, a handle over data that takes you through cloudifying, automating, and uh, making it more intelligent and uh, self-remediating. Um, so that takes us to, I think, today's conversation. And uh, we're going to talk about, you know, seven, um, seven lessons with um, automation that we can really take uh, after the pandemic. And, um, you know, just to sort of talk you through this, um, you know, if you just need to a quick fix, you need an immediate Band-Aid, you can get one. Um, you've got to look at this uh, nexus between data cloud and automation. Um, you need a decent push from your C-suite to be aware of this, to understand it, and you need a pull from employees to be successful. Um, you need to um, uh, diversify investments across the tech stack. Um, we'll get more into this, but use automation to actually automate. Um, this one office mindset of moving processes front to back and breaking down silos is a real prerequisite to automation success. Uh, I see so many projects which are in pilot mode. Um, and, you know, that really means we haven't really done anything beyond tested out on a few tasks and activities, really moving beyond that into a more enterprise wide uh, implementation and understanding is really, really important. And then the seventh, the seventh lesson is where do you get help from? You know, we can't do all of this ourselves. Uh, we need to figure out how to train, how to learn, what products we need to be successful, because um, to invest in an automation, so, uh, a piece of automation technology requires um, a lot of training. Uh, it requires a personal investment of time. And who wants to invest in a product that's not going to be around in a year's time or two years time? Uh, people want to invest their careers in technologies that are going to advance them and, and really warrant the use of their time to get there. Because I've seen clients um, take on solutions and they've just given up on them. I've seen clients buying software and doing nothing with it. I've seen clients um, uh, spend an awful lot of time spending money on training and then finding out it's not the right technology for their organization. So getting third party help is very, very important. Um, so as we look at the data that we're sharing today, what we did was, um, we looked at uh, which companies in the Fortune 1000 are heroes, which means they're um, driving, or, or, you know, we did, we did this via RPA because it was the easiest way to analyze this, but they were driving RPA across enterprise functions and processes at scale. Um, then we looked in the middle at what we call the stragglers, the so people lagging behind a bit, which is still in pilot mode with most projects. They're buying lots of licenses, but struggling to deploy them. And then finally, uh, the laggards, which uh, 
uh, ones who don't really use it at all. Um, so what we've done, you can see, is we've taken heroes, sidekicks and stragglers and had a look at what they've actually achieved with automation. And you can see here the heroes uh, are doing much better at cost reduction, headcount reduction, time to market, better customer service, not by a great deal, but a little bit, uh, far improved employee experience, which is interesting, right? Um, obviously, they're getting better at decision making and they feel they're getting the data they need to be effective or 59% do, um, and then freeing up human capital. Um, so let's get to the first lesson. And um, you said if you uh, had a wish for a Band-Aid, uh, you'll get a Band-Aid. And you can see here that the heroes, um, in terms of priorities for automation, uh, very much look at digital transformation as their, um, as their number one priority, whereas stragglers are looking much more at how do we optimize legacy systems. Now, there's nothing wrong with legacy. Sometimes it makes sense to keep it because it works. And in many instances, it's just not worth the investment uh, to get there. You know, I have, you know, I have my IT guy, and my CFO constantly asking me for new, new platforms and things. And I'm just like, is it really worth that much money? Um, but, but there we have it. And I'll, I'll move to you um, in terms of um, heroes and stragglers, in terms of mindsets. Um, we asked them, you know, how would you describe the current mindset of your business? And when we look at these hero organizations, 73% are rushing ahead to the future to deliver on their plans. They've already made their plans. They've figured out what they need to do. They're just trying to get it done as quickly as they can. And a much smaller number are trying to snap back to the world before. And then there's 16% still trying to figure it all out. They're kind of stuck in the middle. Uh, when we look at the stragglers, you can actually see 39% are still pausing to reset and figuring out how to move forward. So a lot of them are still in this sort of no man's land world of where are we, where are we going? And then 45% of the stragglers, they, they think they figured it out and they're, they're rushing ahead on, on plans already. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now ask you, uh, Naga, because uh, you're talking a bit about efficiency and growth. Did you want to expand upon this uh, with how, how you're viewing the market? I think uh, having worked with uh, you know, the heroes, stragglers, and the sidekicks, I think, uh, uh, as, you, as, you, as you indicated, I think uh, the whole RPA journey uh, for some of the... Um, folks that we worked, it all started as a band-aid and somewhere, uh, you know, really matured to take it, uh, uh, you know, at a, at a clear, distinct level to drive transformation at an enterprise-wide level, somewhere uh, experimenting at a, a silo level. At least what we were able to infer and uh, we were able to reposition ourselves in terms of partnering with, uh, uh, you know, different folks is, I think uh, initially RPA was the uh, you know, front runner for driving uh, transformation while uh, the IT and the, the, the other set of folks were all trying to drive the base systems of records in a, in a, in a, in a different way to kind of make it modernized or move it into a cloud. I think what we clearly understood was there was two distinct paths that uh, people were taking. One was driving efficiency, you know, Clearly, shortage of skill was uh, seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of evolution, the way things get done, uh, you know, in order to make the workforce agile and efficient, I think uh, RPA was actually brought in as a mechanism to drive efficiency, which eventually, um, uh, you know, uh, turned out to become very, very strategic. And I think, you know, once you learn the technology, uh, you will start looking at, hey, it's not only an efficiency game, but you can start driving growth. And I think the RPA technology got coupled with many other technology. I think thanks to a lot of uh, technology players who have come in. And I, in, in my mind, I would say what we have at least understood is every enterprise is weaving its own transformation digital fabric. Right, it could be a combination of an RPA, it could be a combination of a low code, no code, or it could be, uh, you know, I mean, people today call it systems of records. I think there's something called systems of transactions that are actually coming in, and 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 the systems of records and the systems of transaction are actually interweaved by these interesting technologies. So net net, I think the transformation fabric is going to 
you know, for the next five years, at least we feel that it needs one, the, the organization needs to build something that is really flexible. You know, <clears throat> it should be able to serve um, an immediate need as well as a midterm and a long-term need. And, you know, the time frame is also a very, very important. The fact that RPA all started within the finance uh, as, as a transformation thing, I think it started expanding to multiple levels of, uh, you know, departments. And, you know, the durability is also something that the fabric has to look into. So NetNet, uh, what started as an RPA journey is actually, you know, getting towards building a very durable fabric within an enterprise to drive transformation. That's at least we are seeing uh, felt. Excellent. Um, and so band-aids and longer term fixes, maybe Paul at, at Overstock, what are you guys doing? Are you doing a bit of everything as you as you look out there? Uh, I think uh, one of the concerns we had about bringing uh, technology in was, is it the right fit? Is it the right time? Uh, we, we've uh, got a lot of emphasis on machine learning, uh, data democratization, uh, and uh, also cloud as well. Um, so the last thing that we wanted to do was to bring in something that, that was just going to be left field and a distraction. Uh, but we found a really, uh, we, we went through a process of really carefully uh, piloting uh, or starting off with a proof of concept piloting uh, and then seeing that it was a really good fit. Uh, what, one of the other key things, um, and we can probably come on to that later, is also really hitting a, a sweet spot where we could demonstrate, yeah, this has got a really great return on it. Um, it fits. Um, it's something that uh, organizationally uh, that can be kind of dispersed as well. Uh, and it's just not an extra burden on our uh, on our dev group that's already, uh, you know, strained with resource and uh, all these other competing initiatives as well. So uh, that was a really careful, well thought out process that we went through. Uh, and it wasn't just um, the technology, it was also identifying the right partner, the right product, and, and also the right co-conspirators as well, in the sense of finding um, uh, system integrators that we could really work with and help us on that path. So um, a Band-Aid would have just been grabbing the tech and just trying to throw it in. We, we were a lot more, con uh, a lot more consideration went into to that. And I'll, I'll echo what Paul said there. Um, absolutely spot on. Uh, this is this is a, a piece of the puzzle. It, it's not you know the entire solution. Uh, as you're looking at you know the automation and driving truly intelligent automation, it needs to be approached with that digital first mentality, uh, primarily in your your data set and making sure that when you're implementing the automation, that it's not necessarily a short-term Band-Aid. And in, my, in, the, uh, in T Mobile USA, the way that we look at it is if something needs a Band-Aid, that means that we're triaging it. And what's the long-term solution? Uh, I'm not gonna put a throwaway uh, automation that's out there uh, unless there is going to be a longer-term digital solution for that. Uh, apart from that, I'm looking at automation um, to have longevity and to have those long-term benefits, whereas that Band-Aid obviously is a short-term. So sometimes Band-Aids are absolutely necessary, sometimes stitches are necessary, and it's how you approach it and implement the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Desire. Um, so let's get to the second um, lesson. It's about... Um, the automation cloud and data nexus being vital for success. So post COVID, you know, the stragglers are trying to get much better value from their previous investments compared to the heroes who are aligning automation much more to their data strategies, right? And if we drill down further on this, um, we can see here that 83% um, of the um, heroes they've aligned their plans with automation and data compared to 50% of the stragglers. So we're definitely seeing um, a, a difference here. Um, and this is, this is further emphasized uh, as we look at um, how they're organizing um, their, their businesses in, in a holistic, integrated way. Um, and Naga, you've got some views around this foundation for transformation success. Did you want to expand on that? 
Sure. I think data is a data is play, data is playing a very very important role. Um, you know, I think uh, touching upon the first uh, area that we you know we basically said you know what all started as band aid. Uh, you know, in terms of identifying. Uh, small chunks of tasks which are repetitive in nature and it got automated. I think uh, the le- the biggest learning is there were clear winners in terms of uh, driving efficiency, but uh, there were also uh, inferences that we understood that there is a lot of exceptions that are coming out, right? And and these exceptions have to have a little bit of a larger perspective of how it needs to be solved because it is actually not uh, solving a particular department's problem or a particular function's problem. It's got multiple touch points, uh, you know, uh, to get resolved. So that was the biggest inference that at least had. And I think then we started diving into uh, a bunch of data, uh, you know, that was, act, you know, typically if you take any enterprise, right? An em- enterprise basically consists of multiple operations and those operations are basically governed by processes and those processes were the first things that uh, were attacked to be automated and we we learned a lot of exception as to how these pro- process needs to be autonomously functioning right so when we listen to the data we clearly understood that uh, you know what if we have to make this autonomous we need to learn from the data right and these data have to be uh, uh, you know, fetched from dif- different systems of records. Then we realized, I think, the systems of records absolutely need to have a little bit of an overhaul, or I think there is a white space between the actual systems of records to plug in what the process really requires as output, right? So there was an and 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 green field that we figured out that you know you should start uh, you know either extending the systems of records to be self-serviced, both self-service to your customer to your employee, as well as to your virtual worker, which is the bot that was absolutely coming up. And all these things we started listening, when we started listening, it was absolutely a bunch of signal that was coming. You know, initially we thought, you know, why is this exception coming? Is this exception a noise? Then actually, when we listened very carefully, these are the signals that we were able to stitch together to absolutely start looking at what does a a back office want? A back office wants something to be driven at speed and scale, right? And it has to be independent. If it has to be independent, what are the exceptions that we are coming in? And those exceptions were nicely crafted as machine learning. And it was fed back to the process automation. And it became almost uh, a standard for us to start replicating against multiple processes. Then the process started to self-heal. You know, the classic example that I would say is initially, we were solving a problem to automate email allocation to different skills, right? And then we realized there was a, a gap. We couldn't understand what kind of email should go to what department. You know, this is basically for a large telco. And then we created a small machine learning uh, from the exceptions. And then we figured out the rights people were assigned today. There's nobody dispatching the email, you know, manually or, and from there, We went to the next stage. Again, let's listen to the data. Why could you not pre-solve the problem and give it in the hands of someone who could solve it faster, right? I think once we started listening to the data, the whole process, okay, from just, you know, dispatching to allocating to the right skill, it became a self-service model. I think there is a lot of opportunity that we see and all that we have to do is pick the right processes, look at it end to end, look at it from a process, look at it from a system of records and the data it throws. And when you put all these, all these three to three things together, it becomes a unique way of solving the problem. And I'm saying every enterprise will have its unique fabric based on the sunk cost that it has put in, you know, with the technology and the future evolution. At least that's at least an amazing eye opener that we have seen, you know, you know thanks to pandemic, I mean, I'm, when I say, uh, you know, the lot of people have thinking how to, um, you know, structure this in a very different way. How different, Ritika, is this way of structuring that you're seeing? I know you're looking across the whole plethora of workflow technologies and, and data. 
Yeah, I, I think um, we're, we're finally at a point where, you know, business function leaders, um, you know, if you, when I speak to GBS leaders, finance leaders, they're talking about wanting to be better business partners to supply chain and procurement and sales, right? Um, it, and, and a lot of the, you know, current thinking um, is how do we do that? You know, you, you listen to the data, you connect your data, um, it, it, and then you can start to add value. Right, because then you're not operating at the level of, um, hey, if I you know put in a few bots, I can get some cost saving here, some efficiency here. This is uh, I like the phrasing on, on the slide about you know the digital fabric um, of an enterprise. It, it's all about having connected data. Um, it, it, so there's I think a visibility challenge there, right? With uh, what Naga just mentioned on um, ERP data um, being you know, siloed in a lot of cases where um, companies have made investments in data lakes. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of clients talk about how that's great, but that's only showing us say 60% of our actual <laughs> you know, um, process or, or functional view. Um, and so we need to go somewhere else to look for the rest. And so there's a visibility aspect, which is, which is solvable to some extent. Um, beyond that, it just becomes about, you know, what is the meaningful data that is actually relevant that you can surface and then should be embedding into your operations so that, um, uh, you know, it does become self-serve like Naga is saying. So it's a, it's a very different um, and much more holistic approach that um, it, it's very encouraging to start to, you know, hear um, companies talk about now versus, um, you know, the data function is somewhere over there. There's a center of excellence for automation and, you know, in the other department, um, IT is, uh, you know, not really fully connected. So, yeah. Thank you, Rinka. Um, let's, let's move on to the, um, the way that decisions are being made. And, um, you know, this third lesson is about um, automation's really got to have this C-level push and an employee level pull to be successful. Uh, you can see amongst our heroes, 40% uh, um, are taking uh, ownership from the C-suite and a similar number from IT, whereas in the ones who are a bit further behind in their journeys, um, it's a lot more coming from IT and a lot less from, from the seasoned senior management. Uh, maybe Josiah, um, as you look at how decisions are being made, um, do you find that, that, that the uh, situation is changing and that there's more ownership from C-suite or is it still very much something sitting with, with the IT leadership? Yeah, uh, great, great question. And from my standpoint, this is probably one of the more critical aspects of being able to successfully implement intelligent automation. And it's not that your C-suite knows the automation and, and knows what to drive. What they will provide is the prioritization. Um, what I have personally experienced and trying to drive it from, let's say, a bottom-up rather than top-down approach is you very quickly run into the reality that the people with whom you're working across the enterprise, uh, they're going to focus on the activities that their leadership has prioritized. They are going to do the job that's going to pay them and that they will be bonused on. And so if you don't have the priority push from the C-level, uh, you very quickly will fall by the wayside, just in the stance that everyone else has full-time day jobs that they need to do. And you really do need that executive sponsorship and that executive push to be able to prioritize uh, across different business units who may or may not have even heard of automation. Um, so again, you know, from my standpoint, this is, this is an incredibly important factor. Excellent. And then Paul, yeah. you, you've got some comments on winning the hearts yeah. and minds in the C-suite, right? So. Um, certainly on our side, uh, we, we've got a very kind of innovation-based culture and it enables us uh, to examine and bring in technology and we get the opportunity to pilot and launch and, and create uh, opportunities within the company and that's really how the advent of this came about was really um, we, we had a very mature ML base, uh, mature um, well, a, a sort of evolving data uh, democratization 
and making data available everywhere. Um, but this was a really key component that we identified uh, within the product group. Uh, didn't spin out of, of uh, development. Um, it came out of the product group working with development. Um, and we uh, basically created a clear business case, proved the business case. And uh, the, the opportunity long term is, is self-funding as well, which is really quite unique in a lot of cases. Um, and so we have the hearts and minds of our C-suite uh, through that kind of process. Um, but it is very central to our culture that we can evolve uh, change um, really from any source in the company, uh, as long as it's coherently managed in. And, and so now we have automation as a very key play, uh, along with all our other transformation plays as well, and interlocking and growing together and moving forward. Um, so uh, that, that's really how our C-suite buying came about. Um, rather than just a pure top-down, we need to do this. It, it's very much uh, grew out, out of our innovative culture as well. And I, I think, Paul, you, you hit on one of the key points there, and that is not only a proof of concept, but being able to show that ROI. And I, I believe you use the word self-funding, uh, absolutely accurate. And that's what is going to attract that sea level to it. Um, it's very similar to what Paul was describing uh, when we first began to implement uh, the automation. The response was, that's great. We're going to sit back and let's see what you come back with. Uh, and so it did start off initially as, you know, proof of concepts. But once you start to see the the, the ROI, not only from a dollars and cents standpoint, but again, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense, but also from that productivity and the ancillary benefit, that's very quickly going to win over those hearts and minds and they see the value and your C-level will start presenting that value out to the other business units and it's in everyone's interest to adopt it. And you can show that by generating those early returns uh, as a demonstration of the art of the possible. Art of the possible, I love that. Um, so we actually get on to the um, uh, areas of investment uh, that have delivered automation uh, and where they're planning to do it in the next year. Um, there's some interesting um, views here from the um, from the forward-looking heroes and the people in the straggling category, uh, where digital platforms um, are proving uh, far more influential than the ERP suites. And um, then we get down to more of the point solutions, which are being used quite extensively um, by 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 these hero type organizations. Um, so Tom Reiner, um, you know, how, how are you viewing the changing use of the tech stack and, and this direction of travel towards the hyperscaler platforms? Well, it's a great and it's a tough question, but I think I'll come back to my introductory statement of saying, do we have, we have to cut through the market noise around all of that? And unfortunately, much of the market noise it's coming through most from the RPA camp or looking at the market through the lens of RPA. And even if you just look from that direction, I think we have to be to start, as a starting point realistic where we really are. And for me, this goes in two directions. A, we still struggle to scale and we have to acknowledge and look at the lessons learned why we still struggle to scale. But then I think, don't know, if I flip it forward, I think, don't know, if you think about, don't know, what is the direction of travel? I think most clients, if you look at this data, investing in broader cloud, cloud native platform, if you're on the application, your process, your own containers, then your complexity from an operational perspective is just exploding. And again, we're not even acknowledging we can't scale just RPA, be it on-prem or in other forms. If you literally progress our journey from operational point into the cloud native paradigm, the operational some of interdependency and complexities are just shooting up. So I think that's my main point. I think we have to stop just looking through the narrow lens of RPA. But if more importantly, acknowledge what needs to be done to scale even through the narrow RPA lens. But if the endeavor or the goal is to progress towards cloud native deployments, then we have to think fundamentally different. All the interdependency, IT, and the operations, the business side, and that we have to call out, Phil. Excellent. 
Francis asked a, a great question that I would like to address there, and that's how can the business calculate the real uh, total cost of ownership uh, to get to a justifiable ROI when the costs are often swirled away in IT systems, legacy maintenance, on-prem, et cetera? Um, fantastic question. Uh, and that is one that uh, you really do have to have a holistic view on what is when you're bringing in uh, let's say an automation program, there's obviously a cost that's associated with that. And to be able to really show your true ROI, it does take a bit to make sure that you're accounting for all of your costs. You have labor costs, you have licensing costs, you have platform costs, server costs. There's a variety of items. And the onus really ought to be, from my standpoint, on that the, the center of excellence to make sure that you're tracking all of those costs. And then as you're calculating the ROI uh, along with the business partners, making sure that you're really calling out uh, the, the ROI in the sense of, again, it's not just necessarily money. Uh, you have productivity increases that go along with it. Um, personally, my team, we, we calculate ROI as, and the basis is simply, here's how many hours we're going to save you. And that turns into a very easy sell. When you go to a business unit, but the first question I tend to ask folks is, what's your time worth? Right. Um, and I can show you the number of hours that we're going to save you through this automation. And the onus at that point is really on that functional business unit to be able to break that down and say, OK, if you're going to save me 10,000 hours over the course of this year, either that is going to equate to um, and the. Yeah, I, I almost said reduction, and I don't mean workforce reduction because I, I try to avoid that, uh, but either cost reductions, it could be a soft cost, it could be cost avoidance, cost avoidance being, hey, we were paying an outside group to do this before, we can now avoid that cost by automating it internally. You could have hard costs that go along with it, in particular, supply chain jumps out. Uh, you can have uh, that pure time saving cost when you're looking at it from an employee standpoint. It's not that I want to reduce an employees. What I want to do is allow those employees to focus on the tasks and the items that are going to bring the business the most value and get rid of those mundane, repetitive tasks that almost all of us do on a daily basis. I hope that answers the question. And, and similar uh, at Overstock, we have uh, a scorecard that we maintain. Uh, and again, we've had some huge wins on bottom line contribution, um, which, it, you know, is a delight to report uh, as well. Uh, also working with executives and senior management to say, you know, how, how can you redeploy your resource to perform high cognitive roles in the organization, increase revenue, increase uh you know uh, further exploration of efficiency as well so lots and lots of opportunities spin out of this and we try and document everything around that uh, and publicize it so people are aware of the accountability uh, that we have with the expense excellent thank you and i, I did get a question um around who is doing transformation automation across different departments um because uh, I, I think it's a very, very pertinent uh, observation that I, I think pre-pandemic, people were looking at low risk processes, lots of back office finance procurement, et cetera, uh, where you could save time, maybe cut some headcount, that sort of thing, increase some efficiency. Whereas I think the pandemic brought in immediate needs to uh, help companies at the core front end of their business. Um, you know, for example, uh, businesses who, who suddenly experienced huge spikes in volumes of calls from their customers uh, and needed to service that. It changed the whole mindset of automation teams in, in several businesses where it went from uh, just trying to justify the value of maybe saving some money, driving some efficiency, to we can actually help our business keep going and actually delight our customers who aren't able to get hold of uh, call center reps, for example, and agents and things like that. Also, if you're in the products business and you're trying to sell uh, services and products in this market, you cannot survive without very strong uh, data-driven uh, integration with Amazon or with Walmart or with Alibaba or many of these 
uh, other platforms as well. So I, I just think um, the mindset shift from um, efficiency to value has changed the whole paradigm of automation to keeping the wheels on the business, giving us immediate linkage into uh, digital uh, marketplaces, et cetera, things like that. I, I really do think it's been a, been a shift. So let's talk about automating to automate. Um, and here we've done another nice comparison between our heroes and our stragglers um, who are using RPA to perform very specific tasks and to move to virtual workforces. Stragglers are a little bit focused on this virtual workforce and extending the life of legacy. So um, I'll talk to you, Naga. Um, you've got some views here on uh, how to digitate, digitize and automate and standardize. Uh, so could you maybe expand upon uh, what you're seeing here? Absolutely. I mean, uh, to touch upon uh, what you said, right? I think um, many, I think instead of looking at it more as an automation, I think looking at it from a holistic standpoint, I think it is just not automation. It is uh, integration of multiple systems, right? And it is uh, building a totally different sets of workflow and putting it all together, right? I think that is where I, I, it's very important. I saw I, I saw a question from um, uh, Arpan, you know, he was basically mentioning about, uh, you know, who is doing the, uh, the actual digital transformation as Josiah touched upon, I think it is the responsibility of the center of excellence, which is driving the transformation to look at things, both from a strategic standpoint, as well as from a long tail standpoint. So many of the time uh, as organization evolve, we have to look at both these ends. And, you know, for some of it, you know, if you start looking at ROI, you may not actually drive the automation or transformation for certain set of long tail, but you have to look at it from a holistic standpoint and start looking at, all right, I have a bunch of things that some of my systems of records can fulfill. That's what I call it, the rocks, you know? We, we, can, we, we, can, we, can, we can put that in, 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 in the jar and then there are a bunch of vertical solutions that basically comes in, you know, you put the pebbles and, and I think there's the large piece that will address the holistic standpoint of driving the overall experience, you know, you need to fill it with sands. That's where I think the digital fabric basically comes in, which stitches the ERP, the vertical solution, and the bunch of things that you will start ending up using is, you know, RPA, where you need to stitch some, some process, you know, in between and where there is API that you need to have, or rather you need to build because RPA may not be the true API solution because you just need to extend the solution beyond your premises. Then you have to look at some kind of an iPaaS solution, or let's say if you have to totally develop a new interface, which, which is going to drive a totally different experience, then in that case, you should start looking at using your low code, no code, or systems of transactions or an you know, operating model platform that you have to look at. I think net net, um, instead of just looking at it more from an automation standpoint, look at your systems, you know, look at your workflow. How can you digitize and automate net net? How can you put it all together? Is what a COE should look at. And each and, and, and the COE should start pointing it towards every single business function and you know ROI, uh, and measurement of ROI cannot it will, will not be a true hard one but for all that you may be driving a truly different experience the, the you know that 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 could be the usp that could make the enterprise stand out uh, you know comparing to the competition that's at least the uh, uh, the, the recommendation that i i i, I genuinely feel that the enterprise should uh, consider Thank you, Noah. Um, and I've got another question from the audience I thought I'd, I'd share, and I know um, Paul had some views on this. Um, you know, today we've got UiPath, Blue Prism, Automation Anywhere, such a dominating LP market, but what competing product acquisitions are gonna be coming out of the big software players like Microsoft, Google, SAP? Um, you know, what, what's your view on this shift from some of these specialist point solutions to these broader workflow type platforms that, that, that many companies are adopting? Um, from my, my standpoint, um, 
the point solutions are, are playing a very important part uh, going forward. But we have this situation in, in an enterprise. We're not trying to create a counter dev organization, and we're not trying to go against you know our our, our major cloud solutions as well. So um, there is a possibility that uh, these uh, major platform providers as well uh, will start moving into this space either by acquisition or uh, through their own development. And from my standpoint, you know, we've got to watch for that. Um, what, what's going to be the mainstream technology uh, in this in this space as well? So I, I don't I think um, I think that's going to trim the market. So the major players like UiPath are really still going to maintain a dominant role uh, in that, but there is going to be increased um, uh, functionality that's coming out of a lot of the major providers as well. So there will be some changes, I think, uh, in the marketplace going forward. Just adding to that, Paul, I think, I think we have to be almost don't think if you look at ServiceNow, Salesforce, all these guys acquiring RPA capability, the point is not that these guys are entering the RPA market. It's the other way around. They're expanding their core capabilities with RPA extensions. So again, we have to be always mindful. I think then literally what the outcome we're trying to achieve. But from the ISV point of view, those outcomes are different than typically what we're trying to achieve with a master point solution around RPA. Um, but let's talk a bit then about what's holding back success. Um, here we've got some lovely views from our Fortune 1000 uh, automation users. Um, uh, the heroes are struggling with demonstrating ROI and change management. Uh, the stragglers are struggling with uh, silos and getting out of pilot products and things like that. Um, Tell me, you, you know, you get, you've had a lot of views on this mindset towards um, adoption. Uh, does this surprise you, this data? Not really, because again, as most of building on, on what I said before, because I think we're looking up the wrong tree of all too often. Because again, if you literally just want productivity short on gains, then the approach is one side. But if the North Star literally is you know, almost to your point, if data is your strategy, but data shouldn't be sit in the silos. So by extension, the automation approaches shouldn't be sit within silos. But broadly speaking, the current set of RPA technologies don't get you there. So you have to look somewhere else. You know, the obvious one to look for something like, like ServiceNow, cross-functional workflows capabilities, but the market's not talking about it. So we are back on, on almost the lack of education or the lack of visibility, the lack of, of options for clients. But I think the main one comes down to what clients really want to achieve and almost your differentiation between stragglers and heroes. Many stragglers can even convert that. They're quite happy short-term ROI one year, but they don't look beyond, they don't look at transformation. They're happy to get their bonus at the end and don't care what's coming next. Yeah, and um, to expand upon that, Naga, you've been talking a lot about harmonizing business and IT to really break these silos. Um, and I love you to use some spaghetti, one of my favorite terms. Uh, uh, what, what do you think? I think um, merging the silos and uh, bringing harmonization is the responsibility of picking, uh, it is definitely the respons responsibility of the, the person is implementing the transformation. So for example, um, in many cases, I take the responsibility of making sure the the enterprise doesn't struggle in terms of making the right choices right i think if you look at transformation happening right i think business are actually driving it on the vertical side right you know i want uh, faster tools i want uh, quicker transformation to happen uh, you know business friendly tool is basically driving up you know to to, to a larger extent um, you know, the IT seems to be slightly, uh, uh, you know, taking a step back saying, is this tool the right set of choice? Uh, you know, that's where I think the silo gets created. And I think the convergence has to happen. I think it is the responsibility of the solution provider uh, in terms of working with the right set of technologies and bring that, you know, bridging that or bringing that convergence. What ultimately that anybody should look at is, you know, how do you provide that true digital um, experience. How do you uh, give that differentiated service? Net-net, what 
a solution provider or a technology along with uh, the different business units they have we have to think is how do you drive that 360 degrees service experience harmonization where all these processes becomes interconnected right i to a larger extent also own the responsibility of the other department because it's all about one set of uh, uh, you know things that we provide to the customer right i think that mindset you know net net i think we, you touched upon the culture part i think the culture part has to unify this silo break all these things and this definitely the responsibility of the technology providers just not to look at hey if this is an individual problem i'm going to solve it it's going to basically give me that short-term win but i think we ought to start looking at it from a holistic perspective from a process from a data from the right set of technology and yeah. taking the right set of convergence from business and the it and working together absolutely if i could just um add a point here phil th that chart you just showed about um, the heroes are the ones saying we don't have enough change management and that's our biggest, you know, top two challenge. Um, that's, that's uh, all about mindset, right? Um, the stragglers aren't even willing to acknowledge that or don't have, you know, that kind of mindset that this is all about managing change, but that's ultimately like Naga was just saying, you know, where, where you need to invest as an organization to, to be able to handle, you know, cross-functional multiple technology initiatives. Um, we, I've seen this in another study that we did recently where only 20% of organizations were willing to admit that even like culture was holding them back um, from, from digital transformation stuff, right? So um, if, you, if you don't, you know, you can always source talent um, that have sort of technology specializations, you can, you know, get um, collaborating with product vendors, et cetera. But as an organization, change management is the one sort of muscle, I, I would say, um, you know, is really going to kind of help you um, implement all of this successfully and sustainably. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I was just talking with a customer earlier who was saying, um, they had a real problem trying to get staff to do what they didn't want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. exactly. Sorry. No, uh, the other the other important point that I missed to uh, uh, point out is I think the technology choices right should help both for skill developers as well as for citizen developers. I think that is the trend that is coming up, and I think the COE plays a a, a, a vital part. You should let the business do the citizen development as well. And, and there has to be a mechanism that converges. That's a very, very important. I think the, 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 the current set of technologies should give uh, you know way for both of this. Only then I think the transformation um, you know, to a larger extent would get that velocity. I think uh, RPA presents opportunities as well um, for bringing in lower uh, skill levels of technology into the organization. Um, because it's an adoptable, uh, easy to acquire skill set. And then you've got the opportunity to migrate those resources on into uh, the full development organization as well. So I think these kind of key building blocks really, um, if you understand the relationship between uh, all of these different areas, it really can augment uh, the skill base of the organization as well. It's not just democratizing development. It can be augmenting development as well. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll tag on to what Naga was saying. You know, a lot of this does come down to that COE support. And even as we're looking at here, not enough change management. Change management should absolutely be part of that COE. And personally, um, I try to avoid using the term COE because uh, that may mean different things to different people. Uh, it really is an enablement office. Uh, that I'm driving. And that includes the change management, that includes training, it includes support. Uh, I really liked, uh, I believe Samta posted in the comments, how many enterprises really have COEs though? I think that's an incredible point. And as you're embarking upon or continuing to expand your automation program, you really need to look at what aspects are contained within that quote unquote COE and is it holistic? And then be realistic if you don't have 
uh, the tools that you're going to need to truly be successful. Uh, the way that I look at it, I like to use the analogy that if you're not going to fully staff out your COE with the capabilities and the skills and the knowledge that are required to address it in a holistic fashion, you're only going part way. It's, it's like, I, and I would uh, tell my senior leaders when I first started this, that it's amazing that you bought me this race car, right? That race car is the platform. It's the technology. I don't have a pit crew, nor do I have gas. I can't go out and win the Indy 500 without those aspects. It's going to take all of those to come together and really collaborate to be able to build it out and be successful and make sure that you're not leaving out things like change management, which is incredibly important across uh, even a, a small, medium or large enterprise. I think I couldn't agree more, Josiah, and also we shouldn't fall in a trap driven by supply side, taking a COE as a proxy for maturity, just like we even more have to resist not counting bots, almost looking at scale or, or, or progress with that. So I couldn't agree more. Excellent. This has been fantastic. Uh, in the interest of time, um, we'll, we'll, skip, we'll skip lesson seven about calling for expert help. Everyone's going to get a copy of the deck and can read it in their own time, and we'll try and get to some of the questions we didn't get to. Um, but I'd like to get one comment from everybody today on um, what are you going to do differently? One thing you might do differently based on today's conversation when you switch off this and go back to work, maybe, maybe Desire, would you like to think about that? One thing you maybe learned from today that will drive some different behavior? It's a great question. I think as we've talked through it, there's a lot of a lot of very key highlighted points that are out there. Um, as I'm looking at it, you know, personally, one of the things that stood out, and I noticed that it was called out in the chat as well, uh, was around legacy systems. And that's near and dear to my heart. Um, as I look at the wireless industry in the US, all of the large carriers are actually an amalgamation of small carriers um, that have combined and consolidated through mergers and acquisitions. That's a, a large part, I would, a large part of what we do is addressing swivel chair. Uh, and it's not to extend those legacy systems, it's to bridge the gap um, from where you're at right now, having to do those swivel chair activities to the point of deprecating those legacy systems. Um, and so what really stood out to me um, is that there's, you know, they, the focus is there and there is value, um, but we should really take a look at are we simply enabling and prolonging legacy systems when you maybe pull off that Band-Aid and say, okay, it is time to look at a sunset or a deprecation rather than a continuation of legacy systems? That's, that's, a, great, that's a great comment. Um, Naga, anything different when you get back to work? Definitely, I think your uh, the data points about uh, heroes, sidekick, stragglers uh, was quite an eye-opening thing for me. At least, uh, uh, what the takeaway from for me is: how do you bring more stability to heroes so they so that they become superheroes? I think that's uh, uh, one area that I think. And then how do you make the straggler realize that they can also be heroes? So I think those are two important points that I definitely want to reinforce within the uh, core set of uh, execs that I work. And I think it, that's it's, it's a great learning for me, at least to look, you know, start looking at it from the areas of how do you stabilize a few things that you do and how do you do it for long term. Thank you, Naga. Thanks for your contributions today. And, uh, and Paul, I noticed you've shaved for today's webinar, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, yeah. Uh, I think from my standpoint, I mean, we've got a mature ML group. Uh, our data group uh, is um, really, uh, it's got a very aggressive trajectory for what it's pursuing. And it's really about, uh, um, we, we, uh, we have it in place, but it's, it's interlocking all of these tracks uh, really to, to formalize um, the uh, broader strategy, which is, how do you converge all of these technologies so they're in you know, the synchronicity and optimization uh, because they tend to be pursuing their own routes. So for me, it's just really tying and binding those a lot closer. Um, so we're converging on, on really 
uh, a really well consolidated uh, strategy. So that that's kind of my big learning or my big area that I want to focus on uh, from this meeting. Thank you. And then just very quickly, uh, Ritika and Tom, anything that you're going to write about based on this that that hit home for you guys? Yeah, a quick one for me. I loved um, um, Hazaya's description of his own like function um, being an enablement office uh, rather than a center of excellence. It, it drives, I think, different uh, mindset, right? That way you can certainly aggregate best practices, drive some element and, and disseminate them, drive some level of governance. Uh, but ultimately you're enabling your, your entire organization to, you know, take the, the onus, the, the um, I don't know, the mandate for automation and it's not it doesn't reside with just you so i, I love that idea mm -hmm. thanks Ritika. Uh, that was for me it's not so much change it's probably in reformation not to look out to uh, automation through the technology lens and definitely not just the rpo lens and what you will see from us moving forward much more the aspects of cultural change now how we bring literally it operation uh, business operations together that includes uh, infusing almost the IT telemetry and business telemetry, because it's all about data in the end. And these are more the key elements you will see from us shortly. Back to you, Phil. Brilliant. Well, uh, we're 10 minutes over, but we expected that. And, uh, and I just wanted to thank everybody, Josiah, Nagarajan, Paul, Utica, Tom, for a fantastic conversation. Uh, we'll share the uh, deck and recording on hfsresearch.com. And um, we'd love to reconvene everybody again soon for a fantastic debate. This has been very rich and uh, very much enjoyed it. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Take care, everyone.